Well, as we as we come to this sermon time, it's this is the, really this whole sermon is an introduction to another sermon. But I want to take a dive into this and just see what God has to say to us uh, as a people and more specifically as a nation, as as we are some most of us here today are citizens of the United States of America. And God does call people to national responsibilities to the elected officials and to life and society and the culture that we find ourselves in as Christians. We are called to be very much involved and very much interacting with where we are. And so I, I have a belief that, well, I just want to share this with you. One day I was arguing with the Lord or kind of not maybe not arguing, but fussing with the Lord. You know, you can fuss with your best friends, right? They understand that you're not really not really mad at them, but you can still fuss with them. But I was fussing with him one day about the time of trouble. And I was really, really upset that he never had said anything to me about where where he wanted me to go or what he exactly wanted me to do during the time of trouble. And so I was fussing with him about it because it had been over 30 years and he never had said peep. I mean, he said a lot of things to me about other things, but he never really told me anything personal about where he wanted me to go or be or do or what I was going to be doing or anything about the time of trouble. I've been trying to get him to talk to me for 34 years and he never said a thing. And so the first thing he ever said to me after 34 years, I'm having this conversation and I'm a little frustrated and I'm a little fussy and he just breaks in on me and he says, so Paul, what are you going to do if I want you to be in a concentration camp during the time of trouble? And I said, uh, that's not really funny. And I said, uh, but if, I, if, if you really want me there and I know it's you, then I'll go rejoicing and I'll do the I'll, I'll rejoice as you give me power. As long as you give me your Holy Spirit power, I know that I'll be able to rejoice and represent you. And so that was a good thing. And I felt good about that because that's the truth. I couldn't do it unless he gave me the power to do it. But I I know that if God tells you to do something, he will give you the power to do it if you're open to receive that power. So going on a little farther and talking a little more. And I'm a little fussy and worried about the whole situation. What's going to happen? Can't buy or sell. And you won't be able to conduct business as normal. And there'll be a lot of hunting Christians and persecuting Christians and, and manipulating and pressure games and things going on. I said, so Lord, what, what am I going to do? And I'm thinking, what I'm gonna... and here's what, and then the Lord slipped this in on me. And he said, I'll tell you what, Paul. Regardless of whether it's the time of trouble, but, but if things get really bad, things get really hard, and economies are crashing, and, and, and there's just, you, you say, say everything's gone, you don't have a, you, you're bankrupt, you're broke, and you don't have anything. He says, what you could do, Paul, you could just go down to some real poor area, just go to a real poor area, whether it's in the United States or Mexico or Central America or Africa or whatever. He says, just find your way to some poor area and you go in there and you just live the way they're living. If they're living in cardboard boxes, you live in a cardboard box. If they're living in, under a tree, you live under a tree. You just go wherever the poor pieces, you go find the poor people, Paul, and then you live the same way they're living, and you become one of them. And he says, it, it was like, he didn't say this, but I, it was understood. He says, and it was like, he didn't say it, but it was understood. I guarantee you will be happy. It makes sense to me. Because that's what Jesus did. He gave up all his riches, all the riches and all the blessings and all the provisions of heaven and he came down here to live with us the poorest most miserable wretches in the universe he came down to camp and to tabernacle and live with us and Jesus was totally successful victorious nothing could defeat him nothing so the path to freedom in Proverbs 14, 34, 
Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, you know, I've heard this my whole life. Growing up in the Lutheran church, I heard people say this once in a while. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I, I had no idea what righteousness was, nor did I really care. I didn't care. I, I, didn't, I, knew, the, I knew that it was a word that I really didn't want to be involved with very much because I wanted to have, I wanted to enjoy as much worldly pleasures and worldly, what the, what the church people call sin. I thought that was the best way to go. And so I thought, I didn't want anything to do with righteousness. That whole, that whole thing sounds bad to me. And then when they said, sin is a repose to any people, I said, well, bring it on. The more sin I could get, the happier I thought I would be. And then I, and then I started thinking about, I wonder why anybody who's wild and crazy would care whether or not somebody else thought they were sinful. I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't care. I, I didn't care. I didn't care if people thought I was sinful. I didn't, I, I, besides that, I didn't even want to hear about it. If they want to talk about it, fine, but I'm leaving. I'm going to go enjoy some sin. And then it, it just keeps increasing. More and more, I find that people who are really sinning don't want other people to say they're sinning. It's just weird. It's like, I remember when people would tell me, you know what, if you don't change your ways, you're going to burn in hell. I said, heat it up, man, I'm on my way. <laughs> I mean, we were just crazy. And I wasn't even the craziest one. Josh was crazier than me, and I didn't even know him. <laughs> but there's a lot of people that were actually crazier than me. And, and seriously, they're, they're scary. You think I'm scary? They're really scary, these guys. And, and some of those guys ended up being preachers. That's even scarier. So... But righteousness lifts a people up. It lifts up the people. The word for nation is the same word for people. Righteousness lifts up humanity. And Jesus is righteousness. You want to know what righteousness is? You got to look at Jesus. You got to study Jesus. You got to listen to what he said all the way from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse what is it? Verse 20, I think. What is the last verse of the Bible? That would be good for us to just check the pastor on right now here. I know Bruce is over there. He probably already knows. <laughs> oh, it was 21. Okay. Can't leave 21 out. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You sure don't want to leave that verse out. What happened? We lost it. Oh, they're going to put it up there. Okay, righteousness exalts a nation. It lifts us up. But sin tears us down. Now, when you, when you start changing the definition of sin, you get a problem. When you start telling God he doesn't know what he's talking about, you get a problem. Nations get into a lot of confusion. A lot of, when you start saying, okay, uh, this thing about having other gods, that's not sinful. We can have a 3,000 gods or 10,000 gods. We can have at least 10 gods. I mean, that's what the people of ancient times have done. And that's what the people of modern times are doing. There's much idolatry in the world today. Do you realize the Bible says covetousness is idolatry? So when you covet something, you're already committing adult, uh, idolatry. And it's amazing. When you start changing the Word of God, you're going to have some problems. I want to visit with you how our nation began, and, and I'm going to see what they had to say about God and the Bible. And I'm going to look at the first three presidents of the United States, the seventh president of the United States, and then the 16th president of the United States. And then I'm going to look at a man who was born from slave, slaves in the United States that I actually did a research paper when I was in high school. But let's look at George Washington first. I now make it my earnest prayer. You mean, a, you mean George Washington prayed? He was a praying man? Yes. I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have you and the state over which you preside in his holy protection. He's, he, this is a letter to all the governors after the war was over. That he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, to entertain a brotherly affection, 
and love for one another. Somebody's going to look at that and say, wait a minute, obedient, subordination, obedience to the government? Read Romans 13 if you're having a problem with that because that's the word of God on that subject. And he says we definitely must do such. And it's kind of hard for Americans. It's even extra hard for Seventh-day Adventist Americans. And uh, it's a pretty touchy subject. So I'll move on. For their fellow citizens' love for one another, for their fellow citizens the United States at large, and particularly for brethren who have served in the field, as for the men who come home crippled or battle fatigued or, or psychologically damaged. And finally, that we... That he would, he, who's he? God. Oh, you mean an elected official can talk about God? And not be a bigot? He would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy. Sounds like Hosea 4 to me. He's quoting from Hosea 4. And to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind. Pacific. Peace-loving. Peaceful. Of mind. Which were the characteristics of the, uh-oh, uh-oh, divine author. Of, uh-oh, uh-oh. We have a b blessed religion? And without a humble imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Without it, we'll never be a happy nation. Now, someone of great prominence recently, as three or four years ago, said that America was no longer a Christian nation. That may be true. I sure wouldn't want to be the one saying it for the whole world to hear. I'll leave it to you to figure out who said it. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Oh, well, I've been, t I've been hearing how that our nation was not started with the Bible and our, our leaders were not Christians. There's so much garbage propaganda floating around out there. If George Washington wasn't a Christian, I'd like to know who is. Here's the second president of the United States. The general principles upon which the fathers achieved independence were the general pr principles of Christianity. I will avow that I believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. So great is my veneration of the Bible. Uh oh. I wonder why they put their hands on the Bible back in those days. We, we couldn't have been a Christian nation, could we? There's a lot of garbage out there. So great is my veneration of the Bible that the earlier my children begin to read, the more confident will be my hope that they will prove useful citizens in their country and respectful members of society. Here's what he said about politicians. Statesmen, politicians, may plan and speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. You take away righteousness, the nation goes down the tubes. They all said this. What they, they're actually warning people. Every time they say this, they're telling people, keep your eye on the goal, because if you don't, we'll go down. Here's the third president. Uh-oh. Wow. I, and you know what? These guys were perfect. Do you know that? They never made mistakes. They never committed sins. Yeah. 
You know, a lot of people will give you the argument, oh, these people weren't Christians, look what they did, look what they did. These are the atheists, and these are the psychos that are telling you they weren't Christians, because they don't want you and I to know that America was founded on Jesus Christ and the Bible. Was it perfect? Absolutely it was perfect. You believe that? Wow. Is there any nation that's ever been perfect? Just because a bunch of Christians made some mistakes means that they weren't Christians? I guess none of us are Christians then. Because we've made a bunch of mistakes, at least, well, maybe not you, but I have. Do you see how the devil turns this stuff on us and tries to scare us into a corner and to get us to shut up and be quiet? The Bible is the cornerstone of liberty. Students' perusal of the sacred volume will make us better citizens, better fathers, and better husbands. President number seven, the book, the Bible, is the rock on which our republic rests. Yes, America is a republic. It's a democratic republic, but it's a republic. And it doesn't have anything to do with the Republican Party. So don't get all stirred up about that. If you don't know what a republic is, go look it up in the encyclopedia. Here's Lincoln. I believe, the, I've heard people say Lincoln wasn't a Christian. They're trying to convince us, no, 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 our nation, no, our leaders, no, 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 come on. I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. Well, since Jesus is the word of God, I'd have to agree with him. Wouldn't you? All the good from the Savior, uh, well, that must have been Buddha he was talking about. Or Confucius. Or Muhammad. Couldn't have been Jesus. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through what? This book. Sounds like a Christian to me. You know, during the war, he said, he also said, he said, you know, he says, uh, we shouldn't be concerned about whether God is on our side, the north. We should be concerned about whether we're on his side. Sounds like a pretty intelligent person to me. Here's my buddy, George Washington Carver, born in the south, born in a time where black people had no rights. God raised him up to be a mighty scientist, a mighty inventor, a mighty developer of agriculture and chemistry and all kinds of stuff. It was awesome when I got to do that report on him way back, way back decades ago. The secret of my success, he says, go, go look him up, this guy's awesome. The secret of my success, it is simple. It is found in the Bible. And then where this quote is, where he wrote this, he goes on to say, uh, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Now I know, now I know why I liked him so much because that's one of my favorite verses. We sing that, Esper and I actually sing that every time we have a decision to make. We not only pray it, we sing it. We sing Proverbs verse three, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It's amazing what God does while you're singing that song, that prayer. Anybody got any decisions to make? Anybody in the middle of decisions? Anybody regretting decisions that you already made and wish you'd have made different? Anybody awake? Anybody here can, can is there anybody here who cannot lift your hand? I almost got you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Amen. Wow, we should sing that every morning actually. This guy is the one who discovered gravity. 
I remember a trick question they used to ask, who invented gravity? And we'd all say, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. No, God invented gravity, dummy. <laughs> Newton discovered it. There are more sure marks of a... Th Give me liberty or give me death. Well, that's what he's known for, but this is what he should be known for. The Bible is worth all other books which have ever been printed. Daniel and Paul had a few things to say about the government. He said that government's ordained by the Creator, and they serve at God's pleasure. Romans 13 that I mentioned a while ago, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. Wow. None. Not even Nero in Rome. Hmm. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Strong language for the New Testament. That, that, would, that would go well back in, back in Deuteronomy or somewhere. But man, Romans, the book of Romans. Daniel says it this way. He, God, sets up kings and deposes them. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High... That's weird how that shifts when you send them through the email. So that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowly, lowliest of men, the basest, the lowlifer, the lowest lowlifers over men. Now, I'm not saying anything about any politician right now. I'm saying what God does. When a nation is in rebellion against righteousness, God will do some strange things. I call that pretty strange. That's what he did to Rome. They killed his son. Then they slaughtered a whole bunch of other people that, just for pleasure and, and fun. So who does he, he gives them Nero. And then he gives them Diocletian. He was just as crazy as Nero. These people were so evil and wicked and mean. And they're the very ones that Paul says in Romans submit to the leaders of Rome. In fact, the letter was to the church in Rome. Those are pretty tough pills to swallow. There's only one way, there's only one time that that is excused. And that's when the government is ordering you as a Christian or you to disobey the will of God, the way of God. I, I asked my Sabbath school class this morning, I'm going to ask you the same question. If, I want to see, your, uh, if you don't raise your hands on this, I'm going to give all of you a zero. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't do that. Wouldn't be fair. But you'll, you'll know. If the government passed a law saying that everyone must go to church on Sunday, report there on Sunday, go to church on Sunday, would that be violating your keeping of the Sabbath commandment? Yes or no? Yes. How many say yes? How many say no? no. I, I say no. Because... It, nowhere in that law did it say that I cannot worship on Sabbath. If somebody makes a law that says, hey, every citizen has got to report and, and, and report in every Sunday to get their assignment for the week. And you got to go to a church to do it. And while you're there, you need to, you don't have to worship Jesus, but you might want to think about it. At least that's how they'll start out. That did, there's nothing in the law saying I can't go to church on Sabbath. 
when they say you can no longer worship on Sabbath, but you must work for the government on Sabbath, then they're violating my freedom of will to worship on the Sabbath. It's got to include that. If they tell you you must pay taxes or you're going to go to jail, you're going to pay taxes. If they tell you if you don't bring your child to public school, we're going to come and, and take that child away from you, guess what? Unless you're really sharp and unless you've got some homeschooling going, you're going to end up really sad. Because our government is rolling with a pretty big steamroller these days. And a lot of people who are homeschooling are even losing their children. This big government is not messing around. And most of the homeschoolers are free will, free choice thinkers who happen to be, most of them, followers of Jesus. I wonder why the devil is after those homeschoolers that mostly got started through Christian reasons and values. Because he hates Jesus. And he hates anybody who's trying to please Jesus. But God does this. He puts them, he's sovereign, and he gives them to anyone he wishes. And sets over them the lowliest of men. <whistles> but now you think about Joseph, he was sure top, he was top quality. He was excellent. You think of Josiah in Israel, he was top. Jehoshaphat was top. Saul was a little rough, a little, little base. He was a pretty low, low lifer kind of guy. It's amazing what we've watched happen over the past 6,000 years, and yet we haven't realized who's really in charge. Now somebody says, well, did he make... Did he make Hitler to become a mean man? No, 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 no. But there's some principles in the Bible. In 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, If you do not love the truth, God will send strong delusion for you to be deceived. That's New Testament, by the way. That's not Old Testament. You know, used to, we could say, well, that's Old Testament. God's not that way anymore. Oh, yes, he is. Everything you see in God in the Old Testament is in the New Testament. It's just magnified a lot brighter. And that's why so many people don't like the book of Revelation. It makes Jesus look like, look like an Old Testament God. And they don't like that. Because he's a New Testament God. But he's coming with some serious vengeance and for those who don't know what vengeance, that means payback. It's payback time. And the wicked aren't going to be chastised. They are going to be punished. Christians are chastised. The wicked are punished. For those who don't know what that means, you need to come to Sabbath school more often. And probably midweek Bible study too. It's going to be kind of important. No, not kind of. It's going to be very important. It already is very important to know what those two words, the differences are. Here's the trump. Here's when it trumps. Any law of man or government. Having brought the apostles from prison, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. This is where it trumps any law that will go against the will of God. The will of God. If, not if, but when they make a law that says you can't purchase water for your house to drink and to cook in, to bathe in, to whatever, unless you join our church, you better be ready to go somewhere. You better be ready to either go to the concentration camp 
or to sneak out by God's leading, kind of the way he did when Saul, they, he, he was still being called Saul, and they put him in a little basket and they hit, dropped him over the wall of Damascus and he slipped away. So you better be ready to either go to a concentration camp, and I'll tell you what, it's going to take a lot to get ready for that. Because we need to go there ready to represent Jesus. We need to go there ready to forgive anybody of anything they do to us while we're there or on our way. We need to be powerful in the things of Jesus Christ in order to go there. You need to be getting ready to go in case that's where God wants you to be. And it's always better to go where he wants you if not, if you don't think so, go read Jonah. That didn't work out real, real well. But we must obey God rather than man. That means you've got to be ready to go to the concentration camp or you've got to be real sneaky like Paul was and get out of town somehow. Or real, real dedicated like Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem. And God gave him a dream and told him to leave before the soldiers got there. I like that plan myself. I don't know if I'm going to get to enjoy that plan, but I'm sure hoping so. But, you know, Corey Ten Boom went to the prison camps of Nazi Germany, and she's got the same Jesus I got. He can make me victorious, just like he made Joseph victorious. Well, maybe not the same way. I don't think I'll be exalted next to, next to the Pope or to Satan or anybody like that. And I'm not saying the Pope is Satan. I'm just saying I won't be exalted next to the President of the United States or anybody else. I don't, I don't really see that coming. If anybody sees that coming, you be sure and confirm that with God, and then you come tell me. One person actually heard what I just said. The earth. The earth is but a footstool of the Creator. After eating grass like an animal for seven years, the greatest king in the history of the world at that, until that time, the mighty king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, after seven years of eating grass like a cow, finally discovered that God has dominion over everything on earth. <laughs> oh, man. Wouldn't you like to see some of these politicians out in the pasture eating grass like a cow? Amen. There's a few of us who'd like to see a few pastors out there, too. I hope I'm not one of them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> reminds me of a story Glenn Kuhn used to tell. we got time for a story. Glenn Kuhn, one of the greatest men of faith and prayer and power and the promises of God, that the, the modern times, maybe any time, has ever seen. And he said that he was with his daddy one day, and he said this actually happened. And uh, or he was with somebody, I can't remember who he was with, but it, was, it may have been him, he may have been the one that did it. Anyway, he was going by and he saw there was a bunch of mules in the pasture over by behind the fence, and mules sitting over there, and the mules always look pretty sad, you know, like the donkey on, on Winnie the Pooh. What's his name, Eeyore? He's always, bo, you know, always sad looking. And, and it might have been Glenn or it was somebody else said, hey, look at that, those donkeys look like deacons. And, and, uh, and, the, and, and the, the guy driving the car, the older adult says, why is that? Well, because they're all sad faced. They all have a sad face, you know. And that's, that's back when deacons were allowed to smile. But we're allowed to smile now. So it took him seven years. He came to his senses. Isaiah 66 says, this is what the Lord says. This is what Yahweh says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And I'll add a little bit to it. Anybody who forgets it is going to regret it. Here's what Nebi said, Nebuchadnezzar. Here's what he finally said. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Now this is one of the most wicked kings that ever lived. He threw people in fiery furnaces, fed them to lions. He did whatever he wanted to do. He could take anybody's wife away from him and make him his own or whatever, daughters or whatever. He was just a real big time 
big time maxed out creep. Egomaniac beyond measuring. And after seven years of being shown how, how much power he did not have, his dominion, dominion, he says about God, is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Or what have you done? God raises up nations and he takes them down. His patience with nations is limited. The word, this is Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, if a country, if a country, if any country, sins against me by being unfaithful and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and send famine upon it and kill its men and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. No one else would be saved. People don't think he's the, he, Jesus is coming. And he's a perfect reflection, a perfect example, perfect harmony with the Father. And when he comes, all the nations of the earth, except a little bitty group of people, will be worshiping Satan and thinking that they're just wonderful. And thinking that they know God and that they represent God and they've got God on their side. They're going to be so duped, it's pathetic. And when Jesus comes, it says a two-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. And when he comes, he destroys them. He kills them all from one end of earth to the other. He destroys all the nations, all the peoples. The word nation is the same as people. He destroys them with the sword, the word of his mouth. He doesn't want to. This is hard, hard stuff. Isaiah calls it the strange act of God in Isaiah 28. Oh, oh, that's Old Testament. Oh, yeah, that's the Old Testament God. No, it's the New Testament God. And the only way you're going to be able to avoid being on the wrong end of that sword is if you hide yourself under John 3.16 every moment of every day for the rest of eternity. Amen. God's hand is outstretched with more love than we can even imagine. His healing is flowing with more power and glory than we could even measure. But most of the world will not be benefited from it in that day. This is what Jesus said. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The founders and pioneers of America built this nation on the rock. They started way back in 1607, Plymouth Rock, and they planted a cross on the beach. They prayed dedication prayers. They were escaping religious persecution. They were still praying 200 years later when Thomas Jefferson took the office. There's a scale. It's called the scales of judgment. And for over 200 years, the United States of America has been tilted heavily towards Jesus Christ and funding and supporting and promoting the decency and the integrity and the honor of Christianity. Have they been perfect? Yes. 
No. But it's been the greatest nation in the history of the world. More Bibles, more missionaries, more gospel teachers, more orphanages, more hospitals have been built by Christians all over the world than any other time in the history of the world by any other nation in the history of the world. But those scales have shifted. And we are in big trouble. Big trouble. <laughs> In 1962, they outlawed prayer and the Bible in our schools. Right now, they're teaching every other religion, but you cannot bring a Bible and teach Christianity in there. They're even teaching witchcraft in our schools. Harry Potter and all the witchcraft. 1963, our president was assassinated. Then his brother was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Our country's been going crazy ever since 1962. And I'll tell you what, if Jesus Christ was, was a principal of a grade school, they'd be praying in that grade school. Because Jesus would teach them how to pray. And if Jesus cannot be in the public school system, then the public school system needs to be erased. And I know I'm jumping on some serious, touchy religious liberty water here right now, but I want to tell you something. If everybody in the world were Christians, no stores would be open on Sabbath. No restaurants would be open on Sabbath. You go back to Nehemiah and check it out. So, where are you building? Where are you building your house? Are you building your, your house on the words of Almighty God or on the opinions and philosophies and modern thinking of modern man. I'm going with Moses. And I'm going with Isaiah. And I'm going with Nehemiah. Nehemiah hits the Sabbath harder than anybody else in the Bible. I'm going with Nehemiah. I'm going with Timothy and those guys. Aquila and Priscilla. I remember I was still a pastor. I mean, I, I had already become a pastor. <laughs> Maybe that's prophetic. Maybe I'm not going to be a pastor much longer. <laughs> anyway, I had already become a pastor. And, and I know I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I want a prayer life like Jesus. Because that's what Jesus said. John 14, 12, if you, if you believe in me, Jesus said, you'll do the very works I had. So I said, well, I, I need to start at the beginning. I need the prayer life first. I need the prayer life of Jesus. If, if I have a hope of doing anything else Jesus did, I, I have to get his connection. I have to get the same connection that Jesus had. So I begged God for it for years. I begged for it, failing miserably. By the way, I'm still failing miserably, but I'm I'm a lot farther up the, up the ladder than I was 30 years ago. And so, so I begged him, and, and I'd wake up. He'd wake me up. You know, <laughs> some people would call it an ungodly hour. I don't think that would work with God. So he'd wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning or 3.30 in the morning, because that's when he'd wake Jesus up, evidently. Because Jesus would get up and go out real way early in the morning. Sometimes he'd just be there all night. But anyway, I'd wake up and I'd start praying. I'd know it was God because I'd be wide awake and maybe just come out of a dream that God was telling me something. And I'd wake up and I'd start praying. And I'd pray and I'd pray and I'd pray. And the next thing I know, it was 7.14. And I'd been sleeping for about three hours. And I never finished my prayer. And I'd look over at the clock and every time, every time it was 714. Every time. And it started getting really obvious. And, and so I went and looked up. I heard somebody preach and I already knew it. I already knew. Every time I saw it, I already knew. Second Chronicles 714. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek me, from heaven, I will come and heal their land. 
God hammered me with 714. I'd wait, every time I'd wake up, 714, 714, 714. And it, it, it's like, it was like, okay, Lord. I said, I know I'm a, I'm a weak, miserable, wretched sinner. Uh, and I, there's not a thing I can do about it except ask you for help. And you know, evidently, he finally decided that I really meant it. Or he finally, or something, I don't know what the deal is there, he already knew, but anyway, somehow, it happened. So now when he wakes me up at four o'clock, I get up and go in the, in the, somewhere else. And I kneel down and pray. I had, a, I had a guy, I knew about a guy. He had the same problem. Didn't have much of a prayer life. The flesh was weak. And he got so fed up with himself, he did his morning devotions every morning standing on the edge of the bathtub. Because he knew he surely wouldn't fall asleep there. But he'd bang his head. Whatever it takes. We need to put it all out there. We need to put it all out there while we can, because the day's coming when no man can work. Jesus said, no, the night is coming when no one can work. And so as you think about this, where are you building your house? Where are you building your own life? Where are you building your family? Do you sing with your family every day? Do you sing at the, after, before or after breakfast? Or do you even have breakfast together? Do you pray together? The body of Christ is under attack, big time, right here in America. And it's not because of what the Supreme Court did. We've been under attack for a long time and didn't even know it. We've been lulled to sleep and we've been on slow cook, just like the frog. Pretty soon the frog won't even jump out of the hot water because it's just slowly heated up. And pretty soon he's just real comfortable with sin, real comfortable with no prayer life, real comfortable with going to church four or five times a year, just real comfortable. May God help us. And I'm so thankful that we have Jesus. And Lorna, could you come? We're gonna sing this song. It's a prayer song. We need to have a, another prayer vigil just for America, just for our leaders. We had one for the general conference session. That's getting ready to hit the fan Monday and Tuesday. I hope you can fast and pray a little bit between now and, and Monday and Tuesday for our fellow Seventh-day Adventists who are going to be discussing and debating and voting and, and deciding some very, very serious issues. One is whether to teach that God took six literal days to create the world or if he took millions of years, which would be different than what the Bible says. And then also whether or not women can be filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to do the same things that a man can do in the body of Christ. Well, according to Joel, they can. According to Peter, they can. But I don't know, we'll find out what the church says. We need to be praying for God to do a mighty work. For those who would uh, like to pray this prayer in a song, America can still be blessed. I do not believe the time of trouble has begun. I believe that as soon as the time of trouble begins, all the nations will be handed to Satan and then only individuals can be blessed as individuals. Nations will never again represent God. This nation represented God for quite a while. Those days are over. But we can still pray for this nation. Let's stand and sing this song.
time Jesus prayed for a blind man. First time he prayed, he asked the man what he saw. And he said, I, saw you, I see men like trees. They're real fuzzy and I can't tell whether they're trees or men. And Jesus prayed a second time. And then he was able to see man as he really is. We need to be able to see ourselves as we really are, first of all, sinners in need of a Savior. And then we need to be able to see ourselves in Christ, sinners transformed into saints who can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And then we need to see our neighbors through the eyes of Jesus and love them enough to warn them with John 3.16. You don't go warning people with the book of Revelation to start off. You warn them with John 3.16 first, and you may never get to the book of Revelation with, the, with certain people, but you do what you can with the gospel. I'd like to pray a second time for America the way Jesus prayed a second time for the blind man, because we are definitely blind here in America. We need this. Let's, let, can we key that up one notch or two? There we go. Let's key it up even more. pray for our president. I can't think of anything I would be happier to see than to see him showing the nations how to give their lives to the living Christ. To hear him testify that Jesus is the only Savior in the world. I would love to see him. God do that. And I want to see him keep doing that in me. How about you? As we close, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, your word there on the screen says that we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. Lord, I pray that you will make that real for each person here today. I pray that you will make each one of us free, so free that we can speak a word for Jesus in any situation we find ourselves in, to anyone we find ourselves in front of. And may we be able to do it with the beautiful wisdom, the skill, and the tact of Jesus, because your spirit because it's not by might nor by power of man, but by your spirit that we are asking for this to be done. Save us, Lord, and lead us out to not hide in our houses, or not hide in our little workspace or our cubicle, or hide in our cars. Lord, lead us out into the highways and into the byways to our neighbors, to our relatives, and may our first order of business to be, to be able to, by your grace and through your spirit, to be able to somehow get the conversation eventually on Jesus Christ 
and eternal life. Lead us, Lord. Lead us, Holy Spirit. Save us for your glory. Save us so that you can use us to save others. And we will thank you forever. In the holy name of Jesus, we do pray. Hallelujah to his name forever and ever. And everybody who believes he's worthy, say amen. 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 God bless you as you go. Go with Jesus.